Welcome to the latest event organized by the Mayan Institute. The Mayan Institute was founded in 2015 under the guidance of our patron, Lord Peter Hennessy, and brings together politicians, policy makers, the Queen Mary community, and the public to debate <coughs> the major political and policy challenges facing East London and the UK. And I will say as well that we are starting doing some international events, so also the international community. In addition to producing impactful research, uh, publishing uh, policy briefings, and hosting several research fellows, the Institute has a long-standing public events program. This is the last event of 2024, but we will be back in 20... This is the last event of 2023. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm living in the future. <laughs> but we will be back in 2024. We will be assessing the challenges and opportunities facing the main parties ahead of the general election, and we will be releasing our events program for the next semester shortly. Before we start, I would like to thank Mariam Darwish, which, uh, who is the Queen Mary's event manager, Harriet, Sakira, and Alesha, Ayesha, uh, who are um, Spear student ambassadors, and Gary Schwartz. This event will be chaired by Professor Tim Dale, and please join me um, yeah, uh, to welcome the Right Honorable David Gok and Lord Cooper of Windrush. Tim Bale is Professor of Politics at Queen Mary, University of London, and a former director of the Milan Institute. He specializes in British and European elections and party politics. His latest book, The Conservative Party After Brexit, Turnoil and Transformation, was launched at the Milan Institute earlier this year and was published to academic and critical acclaim. The Right Honourable David Gogg was the Member of Parliament of Hertfordshire South West from 20, uh, 2005 to 20, 2019, serving as Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Work and Pension Secretary, Justice Secretary and Lord Chancellor. He lost the Conservative Whip for opposing a no-deal Brexit. I want to clap to that. I mean, for the opposition to the no deal Brexit, <laughs> and for the 2019 general election as an independent. He is now a regular columnist for the New Statesman and Conservative Home. <coughs> Lord Cooper, served, uh, Cooper of Windrush, served as director of strategy to Prime Minister David Cameron during the Conservative Liberal Democratic, uh, Democrat Coalition government. He's founder of the, police, uh, the polling consultancy Populus and advises business and campaigns on the strategy. He joined the House of Lords in 2014 as Lord Cooper of Windrush and sits as an independent peer. He is the author of the second chapter of the case for the centre-right, which assesses the realignment of in British politics since 2016. Please join me in a round of applause to welcome Day today. Okay, thank you so much for uh, coming out on what is uh, a cold and, and dark night uh, to this last event uh, held by Milan Institute in 2023. Hopefully you will enjoy it and come back for more in 2024. I should start with confession, and that is that actually David interviewed me about my book uh, <laughs> earlier <laughs> this year. So uh, there's an extent to which this is, if this were football, the return leg, if you like. Uh, uh, I've got home advantage this time though, uh, and uh, uh, I should uh, add, though, that David, of course, has brought along with him uh, Andrew Cooper, so I am a man down. Um, I think David is more of a cricket fan than a, a football fan, so let's just say that this is the second innings, uh, and I promise not to bowl uh, too many googlies or bouncers. Uh, so, as the first over commences, I'm going to ask you a complicated three-part question, um, both of you. Uh, so. First, uh, David, then, uh, and then Andrew, perhaps. How did you first come into politics? That's the first question. What back then made you a conservative? And do you still hold the same views, the same world view, if you like, as you did back then? OK. Um, well, th thank you very much. And I'm um, delighted for the, to be here for the return trip. Uh, I, I was attracted to politics, I suppose, in the 1980s. Um, by what was a pretty tumultuous period. And uh, I am sort of struck, there's a, there is a certain, certain irony to this that I've, you know, I've left the Conservative Party um, because I was too Europhile for it. And I've edited this book 
sort of making the case for a kind of liberal centre-right uh, perspective, and Michael Heseltine is one of the contributors. But, uh, you know, frankly, like lots of Conservatives of my generation, I was quite attracted to the vision that Margaret Thatcher set out mm -hmm. uh, in the 1980s in terms of the kind of really big issues. I felt that she was making the right judgments in terms of, uh, I mean, I was sort of annoyingly precocious interest in politics, but in terms of, um, you yeah, know, the power of the trade union, the importance of the private sector, uh, uh, Britain's place in the world, NATO, Cold War, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, I didn't come from a particularly privileged background, but there was a kind of meritocratic case about you can make it to the top if you're smart enough and work hard enough and, uh, and so on, and widening opportunities. Uh, so that all appealed to me. And I just developed a sort of strong, passionate interest in politics, largely inherited from my father, and we used to discuss and debate this a great deal, and still do. Uh, and um, and just acquired a kind of love and interest, uh, and a rather sort of unhealthy uh, <laughs> sort of preoccupation with it as as a sort of teenager, mm. and carried that through, and felt you know if you really want to make a difference, politics is where you want to go. But to come back to your sort of question. Yes, I have changed my views over time. So when I first went into Parliament, I was very much on the more Eurosceptic end of the Conservative Party. Not an out-and-out -out lever, um, but someone who thought, you know, this far and no further and worried about where, where the European project might go. I, I definitely changed my position mm. on that. But I know it's a bit of a sort of cliche. I feel the Conservative Party changed more. And so I have you know, drifted a little bit more towards the centre as I got more ministerial experience, as I, you know, I attended quite a lot of European Council meetings representing the UK and increasingly saw the EU as a sort of problem-solving forum more than anything else, and Brexit as a sort of problem-creating project more than anything else. Um, uh, and, and that experience and the experience of, all of, the, of essentially the, the Brexit years and what I felt was the complete um, short-sighted unreasonableness of, of elements of the Conservative Party, I moved in one direction. I think the Conservative Party was moving very, very rapidly in a different direction. Um, so I've not only really answered why I got into politics, I think I've made possibly answered why I got out of it as well. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, what about you? How did you first come into politics? And have your views changed really since? Um, I came in sort of slightly different direction in that I, I grew up in a very political household who were lifelong Labour supporters in East Surrey, very Tory constituency, then held by Geoffrey Howe. Um, he obviously went on to be Margaret Thatcher's Chancellor. So I joined the Labour Party um, when I was 15 um, in, in proud support of the Callaghan government um, and then joined the STP at university. And my first job after leaving university was working for the STP in 1986. And then I ended up uh, working for David Owen. And after the STP split uh, over the issue of merging of the Liberal Party, stuck with him. Um, and then sort of found that on most of the big issues of the day, um, we found ourselves much more often than not taking the side of the Conservative Party rather than the Labour Party. So things like the miners' strike, cruise missiles, maybe the privatisations. Um, Margaret Thatcher kind of openly flirted with David Owen, both figuratively and literally. Um, <laughs> and then when the SCP collapsed in 1990, and I went to live in America for a few years, um, and it felt like the natural thing to do to, to support John Major. Um, at the beginning of 1992, in the run-up to that election, there was a sort of press conference event where lots of the younger figures from the STP did a big press conference, Social Democrats for Major, mm. um, including my friend Danny Finkelstein. Um, and so we, I sort of became a conservative from that side. So I also sort of see myself as a centrist. Right. Uh, and through that process came to the view that I was sort of centre-right rather than centre-left because mm. of how I felt about the economy and some point David's made. Mm. Um, and like David, I think the thing over which I probably most changed my mind was I, I would definitely have defined myself as quite a strong Eurosceptic um, for, for, throughout most of that period, 
more or less until the referendum happened, actually, uh, yeah. which made me, made me really focus on the fact it wasn't really about the many criticisms one could make about the European Union, but actually the real question was what, what, what else is there instead then? Um, so actually looking back on it with hindsight, I think I was wrong about that all along right. and, and have huge admiration now for people who I, who I didn't have much sympathy for at the time, like Ken Clark and Michael Hestein, who correctly tried to make the case for the European Union when it was very unfashionable to do so. Mm, mm, okay. Um, I mean, maybe you've changed your mind on Europe, you've changed your mind on any of the other things you talked about. I mean, you talked about privatisations, for example. Do you still see those as successes? Or? I think most of them were right and, and have been successful. Um, yeah. I mean, there are clearly some which are not, the water industry being, it being, a, right. being a spectacular case in point, mm. um, where you, you privatise a monopolistic utility company and don't regulate it properly. Um, but I think, I think the bulk of those, of those privatisations were necessary. When you look at how stressed and strained the British state is and how much it strains to find the resources for the public services that we all cherish and desperately need more money, the idea that they would find money mm. to invest in, let alone to manage some of these other um, industries, I think mm. doesn't really bear scrutiny. And so you're not the Conservative Party? Sorry. Well, we'll, yeah. do our, we'll, we'll do our best to speak up, sure. Um, so, uh, where was I? Yes. Um, absent Brexit, then, would both of you still be comfortably nestling in the, in the bosom of the Conservative Party now? Or, or do you think you, know, you might have drifted away for, for other reasons, okay. perhaps? Um, I think it's quite hard to do the absent breakfast. You, you can hear me? Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Oh, very good. Um, um, oh, we had really good answers, by the way. That was such a pity. Yeah. Um, but uh, no, I, I think it's, it's quite hard to, 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 to take out Brexit alone. And the whole Brexit process, I think, so fundamentally changed the Conservative Party uh, that um, it, uh, the, you know, I, 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 it, it's hard to sort of find that continuity. There is an element where, I think speaking personally, you know, possibly sort of scales drop from my eyes in terms of, of the sort of level of populism and, and, and what have you. And I certainly became much more sensitive to attacks on institutions as a consequence of the Brexit process. And I think you know, the, the Brexit period of 2016 to 2019 was something of a constitutional crisis. And um, when you go through a crisis like that, then you start to sort of be, I think, more sensitive to threats to our institutions, uh, to politicians playing fast and loose with the facts and political stability. And so I find it really hard to sort of take that sort of Brexit point out. But, I mean, fundamentally that, I mean, if, you, if you'd asked me in 2016 um, that I was going to be leaving the Conservative Party over the issue of, of Europe, you know, even as late as 2016, uh, and that I thought that, you know, that the Conservative Party would have completely lost its bearings, mm. I, would have, I, would have, I would have been very surprised Mm. By that, I wouldn't. Yeah, I wouldn't have recognised that. So, so events took a turn <coughs> with the referendum, and subsequently, you know, I have a very similar experience to Andrew in terms of the referendum m moved me from being a kind of Eurosceptic, unenthusiastic about the EU, but but not a lever. And having come, as I say, having come round to it a bit, uh, having experienced it. Uh, you know, I felt so strongly about the referendum position and the arguments that were being made um, that that set me on a particular tr track and, and a few others, but mm. sent the bulk of the party in a different direction. Yeah. What about you, Andrew? I, mean, I, I agree with what David said. I, I think it, it, it was obvious that the, the trend in which the Conservative Party was starting to move even before Brexit, and obviously one of the reasons we had a referendum was, was an attempt to manage those issues and I think we could increasingly see and much much more clearly now with hindsight that there was a kind of growing um, sort of caucus within the Conservative Party that was essentially much more nationalist than it was conservative in the sense that we come to understand it and actually English nationalist at that 
What I think is remarkable is the speed with which, I mean, almost sort of literally instantly, overnight, that became the single defining belief of the Conservative Party. Mm. And the shocking thing, I think, was not just the discovery that that's where a lot of the members were, but the alacrity with which a lot of the senior figures within the party were willing to cast aside the things which had been, I think, the, the pillars of the Conservative Party for lots of people, including, as David said, the defence and support of institutions, um, fundamentally, but, you know, the, the, the defence of the, of the United Kingdom. You know, all these things were willing to be so sort of put at risk, put into play, if that was the price of getting Brexit. And it became just the single defining purpose and the, the elevation of, of the, the purest definition of national sovereignty into the absolute creed was a, it was a very bizarre, very rapid sort of deviation. One of the things I've tried to demonstrate in my chapter in the book is how abrupt a departure that was from, from what had long been the kind of centre of gravity of the Conservative Party. Okay, so uh, the obvious question now, why this book? Um, what's the take-home message of, of the book um, and for you as editor and for, for Andrew and Ben as a contributor? Well, the, the, um, the genesis of this, actually, Tim, you played a part. Uh, yeah. Um, so I, I've been thinking for some time, what can those of us who represent, if you like, the liberal centre-right tradition, you know, what, what could we do? A lot of us were now outside Parliament. Um, you know, I was writing columns and so on, which you know, makes you feel better, but whether that makes any difference, I don't know. Um, but I was kind of making the case. But you know, what, what, what next? What do, we, what do we do? Or do we just sort of sur sur surrender? And then points, it, it, it reached such a, a point in uh, October of last year and the sort of particular sort of moment uh, was the, just before the party conference, just after uh, the quasi Quarteng mini budget, and at that point, I was thinking, you know, we've got to do something, and uh, I had the sort of thought, well, why don't we pull together a load of people to to, to write a book? So you know, we'll get a, a group of people together. Um, at about the same, t well, about a day later, uh, you got in contact with me and said, you know, my publisher would like to speak to you. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, normally I would have said, well, it's all very well, but you know, I'm not really interested. And I thought, well, hold on. There's a, there, this is a certain sort of um, fortuitous synchronicity yes. here. Uh, so, and they approached me about writing a book myself, but for two reasons. Uh, I thought it would be better to get other people to write lots of chapters. One was obviously a sort of sheer sense of laziness, that it would be easier to write one chapter and get ten other people to write chapters. Uh, and the second point being, is I thought that would be a more effective way to say, you know, so that show that this is not just a, you know, one person on a frolic of their own, but in fact there is a sort of body of opinion out there and it'd be good to get a gang together. So that was the sense of, um, and, and you know, as, as part of a bit of a kind of saying, you know, there is a tradition of liberal conservatism or liberal centre-right values that actually has been the dominant form of, of our government. You could say it was even in, you know, very influential in Tony Blair's time in office, but you know, whether it be David Cameron or John Major, or for a large part, Margaret Thatcher's government as well, um, that represented a sort of set of values that are basically sort of market-based economy, fiscally conservative, um, moderately socially liberal, but certainly not sort of a polarizingly sort of socially authoritarian approach. Mm. And that had largely sort of disappeared from our politics. And I thought it would be helpful to reassert that. So that was, that was, that was my thinking. And as I say, you're, the fact that you got in contact at the same time I was having that thought, before I had a chance to cool on the idea, um, I was already sort of lining up a book. Right. And, and, and what about you, Andrew? I mean, why did you say yes? And, and, and what's your take-home message, I guess? Well, um, I mean, David and I have been talking for a while about some of the, the sort of underpinnings of this. And I'd done a lot of work looking at, actually, even before the referendum, looking at some of the structural shifts, demographic mm -hmm. structural shifts in, in British politics um, and had observed that 
the sort of average demographic profile of Tory voters had, had, had started to shift um, in, in, in the 90s, becoming progressively um, less well educated, less well off, less diverse. Um, and was really interested in trying to sort of unpack that and look at how that related to Brexit um, and, how, and how those things sort of fit together into a world view because one of the other things that was clear was that for most people who voted, uh, remain or leave in the referendum, it wasn't a question just about the European Union. Actually, that was a proxy for a whole set of world views and, and how do we feel about globalisation and multiculturalism and diversity and lots of different underlying kind of core values. And so in that sense the Brexit issue was, a, was, a, was a, a wedge which pulled the Conservative Party a long way from its traditional roots on a range of those other issues and I wanted to try to explore that and sort of de demonstrate that linkage and, and to sort of explore the, the way, in, how in that way that path towards Brexit had taken the, the, the Conservative Party a long way from its traditions to, as I said earlier, to becoming essentially, I think, much more of an English nationalist party than a, than a Conservative party mm -hmm. and how that had become a defining thing and how there is an alternative. I often like to point out to people that um, in, in, in 2015, well, in fact, back a bit, when, when Cameron called the referendum, when he decided to have one, I was working for him, one of the many factors which drove him was people were haunted by the rise of UKIP, which had got 3% at the previous election and had risen to about 9% when Cameron took that decision. And the idea was, everybody said, have a referendum that will take the steam out of UKIP. UKIP ended up, ended up getting 13%. Their vote went up 4% despite that referendum pledge. But David Cameron, because he fashioned a conservatism which appealed to middle Britain and won support from people who'd voted Liberal Democrat rather than competing for people who, who were thinking of voting for UKIP, won a majority against expectation despite the fact that UKIP got one, one in eight of the votes and their vote went up. Mm -hmm. I think that shows there is an alternative path. Yeah. So David, in, in your introduction, you talk about um, the economy and the fact that you feel that Brexit has harmed the economy and, and you feel in some ways that the, the barriers that uh, Brexit has created will have to, at some point, be dismantled, whether kind of uh, in one big bang or, or incrementally. Um, and you, you make the point that that's actually going to be very, very difficult for the Conservative Party because since it's become the Leave Party, essentially what it's going to have to do is persuade a lot of people who voted for it on that basis that Brexit was a bad idea and that actually they were, were wrong. I mean, is there any realistic chance of that happening anytime soon, do you think? I think there's, is there a realistic chance of it happening? Perhaps, yes, anytime soon. Probably not. Um, so, I mean, look, you, you, you set it out well that the Conservative Party has essentially you know, lost. I mean, Andrew will, will be more on top of the details that, than I am in terms of, you know, those people who voted both Remain and Tory in 2016 and 2015. Um, you know, th those Conservative voters, to a very large extent, have abandoned the party. And so what you have now got left is a Conservative Party um, that is, you know, has a, uh, its support is basically comes from the leave half of the country. And uh, Brexit, in my view, is such an obvious economic mistake and likely to become ever more apparent. And as demography uh, works its way through, uh, the electorate will become, I, I, I suspect, and the evidence at the moment certainly supports this, that will become more hostile to it. You're, you're left with a Conservative Party that is largely associated with a failed policy that is increasingly unpopular, and it kind of needs to get off the, that hook. And I, you know, I, I sort of look back at, if you like, the David Cameron modernisation programme, and what he had to do to modernise the Conservative Party was relatively limited. Um, yeah, I don't want to you know, belittle the work that David <laughs> and indeed Andrew uh, did in this field, but you know, what it had to do to detoxify the Tory brand um, was uh, you know, relatively straightforward and didn't get to the very heart of why people had been voting Conservative previously anyway. 
Whereas now, if the Conservatives are sort of to step back from, from this, you know, it's actually going to have to take on uh, a, you know, a sort of a, a fundamental part of the creed. Uh, and um, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, if you are looking at the short term popularity of the Conservative Party, a sort of pro-European message, you will lose more people initially than you will gain. Recovering those voters will take longer than losing those sort of enthusiastic Brexiteers. But having said that, it's a process that for the long-term good of the centre-right, the centre-right is going to have to do that. And whether that is the Conservative Party, um, that's the easiest, simplest, straightforward way of doing it. But otherwise, I think we have a kind of crisis on the centre-right, that, that it's, it's essentially contaminated by the Brexit project and won't um, rid itself of that until it's prepared to, to move on. All the public gets completely bored with that issue, but I don't think that, my view is that I don't think that's going to be what happens. So it's not going to be a big issue in the next general election. But I think over time, people are going to be saying, this is nuts. We don't have the access to the most important market. And if we are serious about economic growth, at some point, we're going to have to do something about it. Yeah. I mean, let's imagine, Andrew, for, for the sake of argument, that you know, some um, voters who voted for Brexit have now become disillusioned with it. Um, is it possible, do you think, for them to stick with the Conservative Party? Or if they have changed their minds, are they inevitably bound to, to defect or drift off to other parties at the moment? Well, um, I mean, I think we can kind of see this playing out. And the first thing, I mean, all the polls say that lots and lots of people have realised that Brexit was a mistake. In YouGov's tracking, the margin by which people think Brexit was the wrong decision, not the right decision, is now about 30 points, and it's getting, it's getting bigger all the time. Um, and I think and there's an important issue there because the Conservative Party are locked into refusing to accept that reality. Mm -hmm. One of the points I make in my chapter in the book is that, there's, that there's, I think there's a, there's a kind of big lie, therefore, at the heart of the Conservative Party in the same way there is in the Republican Party, which is you have to pretend that Brexit was a good idea. And I rather suspect that, that the Conservative Party won't get off that hook until all of the people who did it have gone, which was actually what turned out to be the case in 1997. It wasn't until all the people who'd been in the the Thatcher major governments had gone, that the Conservative Party looked renewed enough to be votable for again. But, but the, what the Conservative Party is trying to do is because the 2019 Conservative winning coalition was so atypical, in the sense it was fusing together a block of traditional sort of centre-right economic Tories with a block of quite reactionary former Labour voters over the issue of getting Brexit done, those two halves of that coalition are, are, are very unalike in terms of their economic outlook and their agenda. So it's very difficult for them because they've just put forward an economic platform which will hold that coalition together. And what they're trying to do is to find proxies for Brexit by trying to find other cultural dividing lines that will bind those people together. Now, you know, time will tell whether that works, but what they're trying to do is to target those people who voted Conservative in former Labour seats for the first time in 2019 because of Brexit, who might otherwise drift away because Brexit isn't going brilliantly and for economic reasons, and come up with new identity politics reasons, culture reasons to get them to vote Conservative again anyway. Yeah. Now, I mean, both of you in your chapters talk a lot about um, the way that you know, the cultural dimension of politics has assumed greater importance uh, over the last few years um, and you know, the impact uh, that that has had with the assistance of Brexit, obviously, in creating what some people saw as this realignment of, of British politics. I wonder now whether, from the you know, perspective of 2023, we rather overdid that argument, and that actually, you know, it still is to some extent also, at least, the economy is stupid, and actually what some people um, saw as a realignment turns out to be rather more, if you like, contingent and, and temporary. Uh, than, than it is as profound, perhaps, as some people imagine. Uh, maybe. Um, time will tell. I mean, I think what's interesting about the realignment is that it, it, was, it happened in almost every country mm. to different degrees, depending upon circumstances, depending on party systems, depending a lot on electoral systems. But if you look at the, the, the sort of shifting axis, what you found is in, in, in almost literally every liberal democracy, to one degree or another, there was this sort of tug of populism 
coming from communities that were defined by being quite economically um, disadvantaged, relatively poorly educated, um, quite remote, um, more rural, very uh, non-diverse. And that, that started in the 1990s. Mm. So in that sense, Brexit was not, did not cause the, the dislocation we've talked about. It was, a it was a function of something which has been happening for a long time. Um, it, in the States, it started a bit earlier and it's gone much further. Um, so whether that's a leading indicator or whether actually it's a, it arrested here now, maybe the, the, you know, the pandemic and a cost of living crisis suddenly reassert economics and it balances back, but it seems to me that the Conservative Party still defines itself so much around a lot of those cultural dividing lines, you know, it, it, it's total fixation with immigration, um, it's total fixation with, with the absolute inviolate sort of purity of, of, of national sovereignty, um, suggests to me that that's still going to be a barrier for a lot of people but but I mean and as we look at elections around the world there are obviously there are now different patterns and, and, and there are places where populism is still marching on and places where you know, like Poland where it seems not to be and to some extent perhaps that's a, that's a, about incumbency as much as it is about about populism but uh, I think it's too, too early to say that that, that it's stopped yeah. yeah I'd agree with that I mean I wonder whether Brexit essentially yeah, if, if, as Andrew says, there's a sort of trend going from the 1990s. Brexit rather accelerated that trend, and, and to some extent, you know, maybe we kind of sort of slightly overshot. Mm. Um, and, and then economics has reasserted itself um, uh, and, and sort of pushed it back a bit. But maybe we're back on the sort of trend line, and I wonder whether the direction is still will still go. Mm. It, it, in that direction, and look, I, I think the incumbency is, is is a really important point at the moment, and it's very difficult for incumbents uh, to win. But you know, on the if, if we've moved on to economics, what is sort of quite striking is the extent to which the Labour Party is actually trying to not create any space on economics. You know, so it's not as and it's doing it very successfully. So it's it's trying to reassure the public that it's not going to put up taxes. It's trying to reassure the public that it's not going to be borrowing vast sums more than a Conservative government would do. Um, you know, it, it's not as if there is a sort of uh, kind of compelling left of centre economic case that is sort of sweeping through the country. Um, they are positioning themselves very successfully as as being not the Conservative Party. Um, so I, I um, you know, I, I, I wonder whether, I mean, I, I would rather, let me be clear, I would rather we return to a politics of a sort of centre-right and centre-left that was defined more on economics, because I think cultural politics ends up being as a sort of zero-sum game. I think it's inherently nastier. Uh, it's harder to find compromise. It's more polarised. It's more divisive. Um, but, but I, you know, and again, look at the international evidence, you know, the fact that our politics is a bit less like that, the fact that our political leaders in Rishi Sunak and uh, Keir Starmer are, are notable improvements on Boris Johnson and Jeremy Corbyn, you know, reasons to be optimistic. But, you know, I, I, do, I do worry that that kind of cultural element will come back and we'll see what happens to the Conservative Party post what presumably will be a general election defeat, you know, whether they are, you know, as a party tempted to go down a, a, a cultural route. And, and, you know, and part of the point of the book, coming back to it, is to sort of make the argument, you know, don't do that. Okay, right. Now, um, one of the most interesting critiques of your book actually comes from someone who we awarded a, an honorary degree to, um, uh, actually late of your home from home, the New Statesman now Financial Times, Stephen Bush. Uh, I'm going to quote it, because uh, I can't remember it uh, uh, verbatim, and then I'm going to ask you to, to respond to that. So Stephen says, the book has any number of strengths. The essays are thoughtful and thought-provoking, but something is missing. Reading the book, it feels as if the authors think that the only reason that Conservative moderates and the Tory left have lost power is the wickedness of their opponents. I don't think that can be the whole story. There's no account of why the Liberal centre-right went from the Tory party's dominant faction under Cameron to a subordinate one under Sunak. This is surely the central question facing Conservative moderates. If they don't have a theory to explain their internal defeats, they surely won't be in a position to reverse them anytime soon. 
one of Tony Blair's rules for opposition is start with an honest analysis of why you are in opposition. I'm not sure, he says, that Tory moderates have an honest analysis of why they've been defeated, and until they do, they'll surely struggle to reclaim control of the Conservative Party. So I, I wonder what your answer is to that. Why, why do you think that you, know, you collectively, as it were, who were, you know, uh, I guess, at the top of the Conservative Party, who were seem to be running the Conservative Party under David Cameron, why that sudden shift? And as Andrew said, it was very sudden. How did that happen? I think the um, I think that there is there's a sort of if you like the long term my view is there's there's the long term and then there is the the immediate impact of the Brexit referendum right. result. So I think in the long term is all the points that Andrew talks about in his chapter and he's been talking about this evening in terms of, of that shift and, and and actually if you want to go back further as to why that is, I think um, you know, you have got the 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 weakening hold of centre left parties on working class voters mm -hmm. who were culturally uh, conservative but voted Labour or Democrat or whatever uh, on the basis of, you know, that's what you did and the trade union movement, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and so you suddenly got these voters that are up for grabs and that is very tempting for political parties that exist to win elections. So you've kind of got that big, you know, big shift in, in society. But then you have got the Brexit result that, first of all, you know, cleared out the sort of the leaders of the Liberal centre right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, David Cameron, George Osborne were essentially out. Mm -hmm. Obviously, not finished politically. Um, they were at the time where I wrote this. But, 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 uh, 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 but so you've got that sort of moment. You have then got. Um, this argument, this, you know, the ammunition that the Brexit result gave to the populist nationalist right was immensely powerful mm -hmm. because whatever argument we can put up, they could trump <coughs> it with the will of the people. Right. And, and, and that's, no, no, you're not delivering a proper Brexit, we're delivering a proper Brexit, we've got the will of the people on our side and there's no compromise, no institution could stand in the way uh, no realities could be faced up to, you kind of got that. And that, uh, from that moment, I think, yeah, that was the key moment where the sort of, um, the, the, what was left of the Liberal centre-right was essentially always on the defensive. And of course that process you know, cleared out another sort of cohort, uh, including, you know, including me, and Andrew left the party and so on. You know, there was this sort of, you know, essentially that, that process. Um, and I think you know, it's the combination of the two that meant that the liberal centre-right went from being the dominant force to being, I agree, marginalised. Mm -hmm. uh, every now and again you think Rishi Sunak is kind of tilting back in our way, brings back David Cameron, and then we have a succession of policies that sort of go in the other direction. Um, but yeah, I think, that's, that, I think that's right. Now the optimistic view is that, you know, how does the Liberal centre-right get the Conservative Party back? If Michael Heseltine was here, what he would say is the Conservative Party has a nose for power um, and this sort of populist nationalist stuff, okay, maybe it worked in 2019, but it's not going to work again mm -hmm. and uh, the Conservative Party will eventually recognise that it's made a mistake and it will course correct as the Conservative Party has done on numerous times in the past. Uh, I'm not as confident as Michael is that that is right, and I, I recognise there is a genuine struggle for the Liberal centre-right ever to reclaim the Conservative Party, um, but I think it should try. And um, uh, as I say, the sort of book is, is not particularly, you know, that, that is, it's not advocating that sort of particular, that specific model. The, the book is really advocating the fact that the liberal centre right should be prominent somewhere. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, what I mean, apart from reading the you know, your splendid book, can can the moderate centre right do? And then this is a question for both of you, really, to, to pull it back because at the moment, and especially if you look, for example, at some of the policies that the government has just come out with on on immigration, it really does look as if it's heading down the road that perhaps the Republican Party is, is headed, or you know, Law and Justice, or Fidesz, in other words, a centre-right party that becomes, if you like, an ersatz populist radical right party. Um, what, what can you do? And what, what, 
Mm. I, I think the most... And, and those people who are still in the party, what, what can they yeah. do? Yeah, I, I think the most important thing to do at the moment is to continue to make the case, to continue to make the argument, to try to persuade people, not to just the sort of slink away. I think you do have to resist some of the nonsense. I think you know, there are absolute, uh, you know, some, I mean, we all individually have our own red lines and, you know, for me, those red, those red lines were crossed in 2019. Um, but I think you have got to make the case about membership, for example, of the European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, I think there is potentially an issue down the road about uh, membership, particularly membership of the parliamentary party of Nigel Farage. Mm. Uh, I, I think you, know, you have to kind of dig in. I, I think there is a tendency for the moderate part of the Conservative parliamentary party uh, who are believers in you know, compromise and working together and being pragmatic of being too compromising and being too prepared to work together and uh, too pragmatic. Uh, and so I think a sort of more forthright um, sort of exposition of, of, of sort of centre-right values. And to the extent that the book is an opportunity to kind of rally around it, um, you know, we're, 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 we've also you know, there is a case for the centre-right website and we've, we've issued a couple of newsletters. If anyone wants to sign up to the newsletter, go to the website. We'd, um, you, we, we'd I thoroughly recommend it because it's usually me writing the newsletter. Um, but that'll change over time. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, you know I, th I think the most important thing is to make the case and to be prepared to call out the, the, the nonsense rather than just sort of going, going quietly. Uh, Andrew, what about you? I mean, will, will a couple of defeats do it, like it did after 1997? Well, of course, it took three in 1997. Um, I, th I, think, um, I think part of what happened is actually um, the forces which sort of triggered this demographic shift were related to some massive um, global policy challenges um, that incumbent governments everywhere found difficult to resolve. Um, and centrists of left and right found themselves essentially having to defend the status quo and the institutions of the status quo, which to increase the numbers of voters didn't seem to be delivering results. And in those situations, you, you have populist parties offering simple solutions to complex problems and people get drawn to them. Um, but I think we have to have the conviction that, that in the end, those arguments collapse. I think, I think it's becoming increasingly obvious to lots of people who, who come to the view by 2016 that one way to make our country better and one way to make, make, make their communities and their lives better was to leave the European Union. And many of those people are coming to the realisation that was a mistake. So, I mean, I, I think it comes back to the ideas in a, in a sense. And what I've tried to do at the end of my chapter is to bring it back to the question. So I, I, I picked Clacton as an example. Obviously, it um, stands out as the, the only constituency that elected a UKIP Member of Parliament in 2015. Uh, one of the poorest, one of the least diverse constituencies in, in the United Kingdom. 99.2% um, English born white, 73% of people voted for Brexit because they somehow thought that would change their lives. And of course, Brexit's going to make their lives work worse. And I think the question we have to address is, if Brexit is not the answer to the problems of people like the people in Clacton, and if nationalism isn't, and if populism isn't, then what is? Because in the end, they did what they did because they were sick and tired of being ignored and nobody applying the resources and, and, and the priorities of the centre ground to, to address the problems that they face. And that, I think, is what we have to do in order to win. Uh, could we just thank them in the traditional way? And thank you for coming.